I want to welcome our audience today. This marks the third faculty discussion of the significance of Juneteenth. This discussion is brought to you by the Office for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion of Vanderbilt University. I'm Andre Churchwell, currently Vice Chancellor of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion here at Vanderbilt, and will serve as the moderator of today's discussion. Our faculty participants this year are Dr. Phyllis Isabel Shepard, holder of the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Chair of Religion, Psychology, and Culture at the VU Divinity School and Graduate Department of Religions, and, is, and should be noted as the first African American to be promoted to full professor at the Divinity School. Dr. Shepard also uh, serves as the inaugural director of the James Lawson Institute for the Research and Study of Nonviolent Movements at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Shepard's work has been described as one that consistently elucidates the complex negotiation of race, gender, and sexuality in private and public spaces. We're thankful to have her here today to bring her unique perspectives to this discussion of Juneteenth. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. Next, I'd like to introduce our colleague, Dr. Roosevelt Noble. He's Assistant Dean of Residential Colleges here at Vanderbilt, Director of the Bishop Johnson Black Cultural Center, and Senior Lecturer in Sociology. Dr. Noble's scholarship is broad and is at the intersection of race and the criminal justice system. He currently is examining a long-term relook at uh, the, the presence of black students and faculty at Vanderbilt and the history of that. Examine it with our Data Institute and it and will lead to a forthcoming work that is titled Lost in the Ivy. We're all looking forward to seeing that. That'll be extraordinarily useful as we consider our sesquicentennial year coming up. It is always illuminating to me and for our audience for sure to hear the unique perspectives and voices of our faculty surrounding Juneteenth, particularly given its role as an important marker on the calendar of both black and American history. Before I engage you with questions, I think it'd be good to set the stage for those who are not familiar with the history of Juneteenth to offer a brief review. If we go on a time capsule back to June 19, 1865, the key date, that was the date that enslaved Africans in Texas were told that slavery had ended. Recognize that's two years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed and two months after the Confederate General Robert E. Lee had surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox, Virginia. Despite the formal surrender at Appomattox, the Confederate Army continued fighting on. As a matter of fact, it gathered a number of other troops from the South to move Southwest with the hope that they could continue the fight in Texas. Though they achieved some victories, the Confederate generals finally surrendered on June 2nd, 1865. Uh, Kirby Smith uh, surrendered and he was in charge of the Confederate Army called the Trans-Mississippi Confederate Army. He surrendered in Galveston on June 2nd, 1865 to the general there of the Union Army, General Gordon Granger, who was in charge of the post there. Around after the surrender took place, uh, the United States government prepared and issued order number three, announcing the end of legalized slavery in Texas. Slavery was not officially ended, of course, as we know, until December 1st, 1865, when the 13th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified. I think it may be useful to, to, uh, for me to read and for you to hear some of that General Order 3 uh, as to how it was phrased and written. It offers some key insights uh, into the times. General Granger said, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages they are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere in the state of Texas. So that sets the stage for our discussion here. If I could kind of 
kick it off a little bit, William Faulkner in his, in his 1951 novel, Requiem for a Nun, wrote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Echoes of the past remain resonant in American culture. Our current struggle to retain our civil rights, as well as uh, our other minority community members, is under assault. All point to the absolute truth of Faulkner's statement, that the past continues to echo. In, in the past George Floyd era, we need to acknowledge these historical markers, such as Emancipation Proclamation, such as Juneteenth, such as July 4th for that matter, because they remind us of how far we've come, but what work is still left to be done. Equality and equity for all minoritized members of our community are still an ongoing challenge and effort here in this country. It is useful to review the, the great orator Frederick Douglass's speech on July 4th. He mentioned on that occasion of the ambiguity that black Americans face in trying to acknowledge July 4th while they remain under the pressure of racism as well as other minority groups at that time too and still existing now. If we look at our historical markers, let's just take a look at that in terms of Juneteenth and the dates surrounding that. So 1980, Texas made June 19th an official holiday. In 2021, in the wake of all the social turbulence that was occurring in this country, President Joe Biden signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act into law. It's a federal holiday based on that. This year on May 5th, Governor Bill Lee made Juneteenth an official state holiday, and just recently Vanderbilt has made Juneteenth an official paid holiday. University will not hold classes on June 19th beginning in 2024. So a lot of recent markers have been laid down and ha have made the case of the struggle that still exists on racism and equity in this country for people from minority groups. And this sets the stage now for us, for me to bring in my colleagues to engage in some questions and their thoughts about Juneteenth. And I'd like to begin with uh, Professor Noble what does Juneteenth mean to you personally, Roosevelt? Uh, you know, it's described as American Second Independence Day. Yeah, I think, think something you just said when you mentioned that um, it's a time with all of these different historical markers, how they draw attention to the ongoing ways in which uh, equality is still not achieved. Uh, Juneteenth to me, I, I, I don't think we've done enough of that in terms of pointing out the ways in which these inequalities persist. Um, so for me, Juneteenth is always a day and an opportunity to not only celebrate, but educate about the ways in which um, modern day iterations of whether it's slavery, um, whether it's lack of constitutional rights, whether it's lack of civil rights. Um, to me, it's an opportunity to kind of educate about those things as well. So as much as I enjoy the, the celebration, uh, the education part, so I think even more important. So, and it personally is a holiday that my family and I have celebrated for a long time, actually longer bef <laughs> before it was commercialized and became popular. Um, I, um, my, I'm proud of the fact that I have a group of aunties who for the better part of 20 years have been the organizers of my hometown Juneteenth celebration, Juneteenth holiday celebration. So, so it's been something that's been a part of my life for a while. Um, and it's glad to see that it's finally been acknowledged at the national level at our, in our state and as well as on our campus. So. That's great. Yeah. Professor uh, Shepard, any, yeah. any personal thoughts? Yes, I, one, you began with Faulkner, um, that the past mm -hmm. is never dead. And of, of course, bringing my psychological lens, um, I think uh, the education piece and the imaginary, and that's what Faulkner's reminding us of, that the way it stays alive is in the actions, the violence, mm -hmm. et cetera, but also in the psychology of what Juneteenth means. The reason I think we remember it is so that we can resist the ways in which the past continues to have such a hold on us, mm -hmm. but also to imagine a future very differently. Um, and in my own recognizing of it, I try to make it a holy day. Um, mm -hmm. And anything that's holy and sacred holds both the terror and the hope and possibility. That's great, that's great. You know, when I think of your work, Roosevelt, in the criminal justice system and the disparities that you have 
described and discussed in your book, uh, it makes another case of the, the, the journey that we're still on, right? Mm -hmm. it, it does. And um, this past February, I took a group of students for our Black History Immersion excursion. And we went down to um, Montgomery, Alabama, and we went to Brian Stevenson's Legacy Museum, which is really a celebration of celebra celebration and education about the movement from enslavement to mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. And if, if you've never seen that, I'd encourage everybody to see that. Uh, the last exhibit in there is actually a bronze statue of a clearly African female slave mother and she's swatting down and she's touching hands with a clearly contemporary African-American male in prison. And so to me, I think um, wow, that's there, there is a, a strong connection between, you know, present day mass incarceration as well as in, in, in slavery. And, and Brian Stevenson in his work lays it out very, very eloquently by way of a um, museum. But there's a number of different texts and a number of different laws and things of that nature that when you really start to dig deeper and think about matters of private prison, uh, core civic, which is you know nationally headquartered here here in Nashville. Uh, there's certain elements of, of our mass incarceration system that, that certainly have bear a strange similarity to to slavery. Wow. Excellent. Clearly both Please. believe that black bodies are mm -hmm. for work yeah. and work without payment. Yes. So yes. her her showing the link, yeah. it makes so much sense. Yeah. And it's powerful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In these hyperpolarized times, I think it's important to acknowledge that such a day and moment in our history exists. It is not to be banned, or it has been banned, as some, some events and books are being subject to now. Why is it equally important for white America to acknowledge and understand the significance of this date? Any thoughts on that, Dr. Shepard? Mm, yes. Yes, because, well, first of all, I, I can't remember who said, um, we. We don't have black people in the United States without white people, and we don't have white people without black people, that those are so entwined in the history of who and what the United States is. Um, and I think of Juneteenth as a part of that fabric of our history. And if it gets relegated to black folks' history, it, it eradicates the dynamic that continues to reverberate in our contemporary times. This is a history that we all have to grapple with. It's an American with. history. It, it needs to be in the American history textbooks. That, that's right. right. That's right. Amidst all the other history. Exactly. So we get the whole trajectory. Mm -hmm. Thoughts, uh, Roosevelt? Yeah, I, th I think um, similar to what Dr. Shepard said, um, it's... it's to me, I think it's important that this, this not just be a, a opportunity for black people to come together and to celebrate, but I think it's a chance for all of us uh, to reflect on the ways in which these things continue to manifest themselves. And going back to Faulkner's quote that you started with, uh, history is never dead. Um, and, and it's strange and interesting how in the present times that we are, and, and this push to kind of either rewrite history or forget history, and I think when we do that, we lose sight of the fact that these things still have so much relevance today. Um, and so I think, it, I think it is important that it not just be a, a black people thing, that it is something that all people take the opportunity to reflect and, and, and honor, recognize, and then do something about the ways in which we still see the essence of the spirit of what Juneteenth is about manifesting itself in other places. So I think that's, that's why I think it's important. You know, erasure is not part of what academics is about, right? History needs to be preserved. Uh, even in the context of Yale, when they were confronting uh, J.W. Calhoun Hall, renaming uh, one of Yale's benefactors was a South Carolina slave owner. And, it, and the hall has him giving food to a, a kneeling slave uh, in a stained glass window. And there was a big brouhaha there at Yale as whether or not they should take the windows down should, uh, as, and as they changed the name of the hall. And it became clear from their fairly uh, deep analysis and discussion with all stakeholders, students, faculty, alumni, that let's not erase it, let's remove the picture, but let's put it in a, in a place in a museum where that history can be still understood, read, studied, and, and maybe even written about too. So I, I think the concept of banning books or banning segments of American history obviously is something that is antithetical to anything that we would agree uh, should be part of the discourse in an American University of Higher Education. Well, that says a lot about what we think should be happening in higher ed. 
Right, exactly. <laughs> that kind of critical discourse, um, yeah. Yeah, no question. Uh, both of you are teachers and lecturers. Uh, how do you incorporate, or do you incorporate, or have you thought about incorporating Juneteenth into your work? Um, uh, Dr. Shepard? Um, so for me, I don't incorporate the holiday because it's in June and I'm not usually teaching in June. This but is true. <laughs> right? that. that school's out. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but what I incorporate, obviously, are the historical um, dimensions of the holiday. I incorporate the ways in which um, the reason it's taken so long for the holiday to be recognized you know, as a federal holiday has to do with the push and pull of resistance to actual um, the liberation of our country's psyche around enslavement. And so that's intertwined in, in that way. I teach a course on Franz Fanon, and um, we, one of the things we talk about is the psychology of the oppressed, but also the psychology of the oppressor. And I think Juneteenth um, makes us face those dynamics. Yes. Yes, both of us, <laughs> both sides of, the, right. of, of, the, of, of, this, of this discussion. How about yourself, uh, Rosa? You do, you do a lot of work in terms of taking students to various venues to take them on site so they can see uh, the civil rights movement there in Montgomery, what occurred there or in Selma. You do a lot of great stuff with that. But in the context of the classes, though, the prison life class in particular, which I taught for the better part of 20 years, um, one of the things we do is actually take students on tours and we go to visit. We've, Riverbend Maximum Security Institution, Tennessee State Prison for Women, which is now uh, named after Deborah Johnson. Um, but before we get to that point, we always talk about the history of prisons. And in telling the history of prisons, one of the things that's very interesting is that if you go back to pre the Emancipation Proclamation, you would be hard pressed to find black inmates, um, in part because that labor and their bodies were more valuable to the slave owner. Um, or shortly thereafter, um, we see this mass influx, and you have things like the convict leasing system that takes off, which is kind of the old predecessor to what we currently have in terms of private prisons in some ways. So, so for me, yes, we do talk about it in the context of that period of time from emancipation to roughly that first 30 or 40 years of our country or of our country's prison history. Um, we saw this major, major mass influx in terms of black bodies being in prison, and was largely because of things like the convict leasing system things like black codes, uh, which made basically just about every behavior that you can imagine illegal, which was then an avenue to incarcerate people. So but that's part of that history that we have to tell in that period right after the Civil War, right after the Civil War ended. That's great. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, Phyllis is a member of the, of the Divinity School. It's clear of the central role of the black church in galvanizing black folks in socially and, in, and, in, and for political purpose in this country. Where does Juneteenth fit in there? And I. And I, I, I've done a little reading, uh, and certainly not as much as you have, but uh, I'm struck by uh, the fact that uh, in the early years of slavery, uh, the enslaved Africans uh, had to actually come to church with their white uh, owners, and they would be put in a certain place in church. Mm -hmm. and eventually, they allowed uh, black folks to build their own single-room cabins uh, in which they could uh, have their own services there. And so that was a place where you could have social, some social justice, social, cer certainly some social constructs mm -hmm. about what they could do to better themselves. Mm -hmm. you, you know, the, <laughs> you mentioned how they had to go to churches where their s uh, slave owners went to church. And so what that should tell us, at least one of the things, is that slave owners recognize the power of religion, l interpret it from a liberation lens, and therefore, they had to enforce their own interpretation on biblical narratives, et cetera. I mean, we, most of us know the story of um, Howard Thurman's grandmother who refused, you know, there's the text where Paul says, slaves be silent, et cetera, et cetera. And basically she says, that's not, um, that text is not legitimate. It's not a biblical text. So I think, um, if we look at the, the long history of what we're calling the black church, which of course is not a monolith, but if we look at the long history, a good deal of its function and religious language, music, etc., was about 
liberating and surviving, liberation and survival, um, resistance in the ways in which each historical context permitted. And of course, there's also a pushback from that because if you sit at the feet of um, slave owners, preachers who they've hired, certainly I think that's where we get the notions of, you know, it'll all be better in the by and by. So there's that push and pull, but yeah. I had never thought about it, but you could imagine uh, that they made an egregious error when they allowed us to build our own churches, right? Uh, if they had con strategically. continued strategically <laughs> their indoctrination of their notes using religion and uh, the text of the Bible as a way to modify our view of what our world should look like, uh, they lost out when they allowed us to, to create our, our, our small single room churches and to develop our own sense of, uh, of salvation uh, that, that we hope would come. Hope, hope would definitely would come. Uh, Roosevelt, as director of the BCC, how do you integrate this holiday, and you do it beautifully too, in your center's activities, and, uh, and you use it as a teaching moment too then uh, with your students. Uh, uh, we, you do a lot of barbecuing, I know, and uh, we have some great food out there. I was in, our, in the great text that we use uh, from the great Harvard professor who's from Texas, and Ed talks about uh, red velvet cake, uh, red... Uh, Red sodas, uh, are you familiar with anything tied to that? Do, do you do any red sodas or, or red velvet cakes? <laughs> yeah, we, um, first off, just in terms of how we incorporate it into the BCC, um, I incorporate it there in, in another capacity I'm gonna talk about as well, but at the BCC in particular, um, the holiday, it always falls in the summertime, so similar. Uh, we don't have as many students on campus, but we still don't waste the opportunity to, to celebrate it. And the very first year we celebrated it, um, I will never forget because I grilled and I was on the grill <laughs> and I said I will never do that again in life because there were, I didn't realize how many people were actually on campus and so we <laughs> the line went from the BCC probably to Kirkland oh wow and, and people I was like why won't they go somewhere else and get lunch <laughs> man you're so, making some good barbecue man <laughs> so ce celebrating it on that day around the center is important and we'll have a, a big celebration which I hope to talk about slightly later but we try to incorporate the spirit of Juneteenth in, in the essence of the building throughout the year. And when I think about, in particular, one of our rooms in there, is the, every room in that building it has been very strategically designed and crafted and decorated by me. The seminar room in there, the seminar room, if you ever go in that room, there's a green wall, there's a gold frame and a silver frame, and there's cotton that sits right underneath those frames. And on the wall opposite that is the quote, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the hopes and the dreams of the slave. I tell all of my students that study in that room, if there was a living room of the Black Vanderbilt experience for undergrads, it's that room, mm. right? And I tell them all the time, regardless of what that chemistry test may tell you, what that calc exam may tell you, never forget the fact that you are ancestors of all the streams. Never forget the fact that we generated the wealth and laid the foundation for this country. So we don't run from our history, we steer into it and we celebrate it, okay? So that's a one small way. Uh, secondly, I bring it in when I think about um, beyond the BCC, but in, and when I put on my other role, I wear a number of different hats, but when I put on the hat of faculty head of house mm -hmm. um, or assistant dean of residence colleges, and more importantly, dad, right? One of my favorite programs that we did last year, we'll probably do it again this year, um, with all of the kids on the commons, you said something earlier when you said imagination. Mm -hmm. and when I hear that word, a lot of times I think about kids, because I think adults sometimes we forgot how to imagine, mm -hmm. but kids haven't, right? And so we, put, we have a Juneteenth celebration with all of the kids on the commons. And, and we have a Juneteenth pageant. And my daughter last year was crowned Miss Juneteenth because traditionally that's something that we do. That's part of a Juneteenth celebration. Um, and, and I love the, the watching, watching the kids eat the red velvet cake and drinking the, the red soda. Uh, and my son loves watermelon, so he, he got to be very watermelon down that day. So we, we try to incorporate it. Uh, I try to incorporate it and in beyond just the hat of the BCC, but when I put on the hat of faculty head of house, dad, and all these other things, I think it's important to kind of plant that seed with our students and our kids as well because they have the greatest sense of imagination. I'm not a Epicurean uh, major or, or, or a knowledgeable person, but I did look up at the red. The red aspect of it, apparently red is connected with joy, jubilee, and uh, resilience. And so it kind of makes sense how they would connect that uh, to the red soda. A, a yeah, bigger, other comments, sir? Uh, yeah, another connection with that, though, is um, we like to celebrate red as a representative bloodshed from slavery and our ancestors in the transit, transatlantic 
slave trade. Uh, so red has, all of the colors have significant meanings, but red, red is one that, um, and, and, and I, I don't shy away from telling her, even the students that, students meaning like our, our kids, uh, that these are what all these different colors represent, but red is a very powerful color. No question, no question. Well, I really appreciate it. This has been a very rich discussion here. We're coming to the, towards the end, and I thought I would leave a few minutes for comments by each of my, uh, my guests, and I'll uh, start with uh, Dr. Shepard. Mm. I think um, something we don't talk a lot about, but um, the, the various ways in which we can communicate what we want to say about um, Juneteenth and all that it represents. And I'm gonna make a, um, make a plea for greater engagement in our um, artistic and literary resources so that, uh, imagination, so that we can actually hear and read and see the ways in which our imagination as a people has been operative from day one and continues to hold particularly the hopes and dreams as well as the challenges and sorrows in our material, if you will, productions of art and music and um, literary accomplishments. Thank you, excellent, excellent. Roosevelt, uh, any thoughts? Yeah, I think for me, a, a final thought is to kind of, I want us to make sure we give consideration for how we show up and how we acknowledge today. Um, I think um, there have been some epic fails, whether it was Walmart and the Juneteenth salad or ice cream. Um, I think we can over commercialize it. I think this is a holiday that has been celebrated by African Americans and black culture for over 100 years. Um, and, and with that, in some places, I think it's a relatively sacred holiday. And sometimes when you take things that are smaller and you upscale them, you can lose the essence and the culture and the soul of that holiday. And I want us to make sure that we don't lose that, uh, which is why uh, even as we, the celebration that we'll have at the Black Cultural Center, uh, there's an African drum ensemble because the history of the drums, I want people to understand that. Um, there's information, there's games, uh, but all of the games have educational pieces to it, right? Because if we just take it as, you know, it's, this is a day off, as opposed to actually reflecting and, 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 and doing something deeper, uh, I think it becomes overly commercialized as just an opportunity to kind of do nothing in the summertime. We get in, one of these days in the summer, some of what we get in, in the fall, or not in the fall, but the wintertime when MLK Day. But, so I want us to be mindful of how we show up and how we celebrate it um, and, and not let it get too overly commercialized. Well, I really appreciate you all's comments. I want to thank you all, Dr. Shepard and Noble, for sharing your unique perspectives. Uh, you certainly have brought uh, a different lens uh, than our prior events have on this, and that's really the power of it. Let's have another uh, lens from another perspective, whether it be from a sociologist or someone who works in ethnology as well as in religious and divinity studies. It's really spectacular to hear this. I think from my vantage as we close here, I think Juneteenth is an important marker, and as uh, Dr. Noble pointed out, it's been around for many, many years. And I think uh, the work of Carter Woodson, the great Negro historian who wrote the uh, definitive book on this way back in the middle of the 19th, uh, early part of the 20th century, there's a lot of American history that we don't study, that we don't know, that is so informative. And it, and it cuts across not just the histor historical uh, dates, uh, but uh, as we've pointed out, there's a lot of culture to learn. There's a lot about the symbolism of food, how food is important for different uh, facets and parts of American culture, African American culture, Native American culture, Jewish culture. We, we need to embrace that, embrace all of these different elements of art, writing, poetry, drama, cuisine, as all parts of American history and American culture. And I hope that's what you have been able to gather uh, with this discussion today, and I thank my colleagues. And I want to lastly thank our audience for joining us, and please have a great day, and please celebrate Juneteenth. Take care.